The second half is a little bit more maybe focused on, on actual projects and materials, uh, what's been used to build them uh, to ensure health and well-being. We've certainly seen plenty of reason to think differently about materials than has been done historically. So first up, i um, very pleased to say we have James Todd, Associate Director of, at Archetype. Uh, uh, Archetype, you may know, architects have done some really interesting things, very thoughtful buildings, and in particular, James is um, going to talk about the Enterprise Centre at UEA, which he was the project leader for. It's a, it's a building you may have seen being written up here and there. Um, so over to James, please. Thank you very much. So, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, archetypes, history as a practice, and our interest in uh, kind of natural building materials. Our approach specification. Uh, I'm going to kind of bring that up to date by looking at the project we recently completed at UEA, uh, the Enterprise Centre at UEA, a bit of a discussion about material strategy and philosophy there, and how that's kind of built on the research we've been doing over many years. Uh, and then I'm going to touch on the kind of research we're doing at the moment into uh, materials and their health impacts, and put that in a little bit of context, maybe. So just very quickly, Archetype, we're about, I think we're 70 people now. I think we're more than that. Um, and we've been around for about 30 years, so the practice started in the mid-80s. And I think right from the beginning uh, of Archetype, I'm just talking to Tom about this, uh, the original founding directors, uh, John Broom, Bob Hayes, were very interested in trying to kind of build responsibly. And that went through from a kind of social focus of practice in, in, in kind of working with the principles of Walter Siegel in terms of kind of uh, uh, community housing, but also then through to energy, so looking at kind of obviously minimising operational energy and carbon, probably not carbon back then in the 80s, but I guess that focus has grown over the years. Uh, but then also a real interest in kind of the actual environmental impact that materials have. So quite often when people are thinking about energy efficiency of buildings, they focus on the operational energy and not necessarily on the impact that the materials have, and we're finding that as buildings get more energy efficient, everybody's aware of this now, that the embodied impact of materials are, are becoming an increasingly large proportion of the overall impact of the building. I think it's also worth saying that that impact happens when you build the building, so it happens immediately, and when you build a low energy building, your energy savings only accumulate over time, so actually that, that huge impact on the environment happens on day zero, basically, when you open your building. So something we think is really important, the kind of strategies we've explored to address that, obviously looking at kind of bio-based renewable materials, a lot of the incidents we just saw before the break, and recycle and reclaim materials, kind of building on the idea of the circle economy. But we're also interested in how these materials kind of promote uh, health and well-being and how people actually feel uh, when they're in these sort of spaces. And I think that's a kind of really important aspect of using natural materials is that kind of connection back to nature, uh, which can be overlooked. So going back in time a little bit, this is kind of late 80s. This is a project that we completed London Wildlife Trust, uh, Pokemon is still there today, still loved, still used, made of timber, it can, timber buildings can last, they're maintained properly. Uh, so this is kind of really an exposition in how you can use kind of simple raw materials to create a delightful small building uh, with kind of lovely quality of space and light. Uh, and the original Walter Siegel idea was really how you can use materials that are kind of basic with raw materials from your kind of local building centre and kind of assemble them with a limited amount of skill to make a, make a piece of architecture. This then sort of started to get scale, scale up. So this is kind of one of the first examples we're working on a kind of non-domestic building. So this is actually for the Horniman Museum. Again, the building's still there, still well loved. It's trying to change its function over time. This was actually uh, looking at the idea of uh, kind of big, large spans in, in using timber, um, integrating that with the kind of M&E systems. And the whole thing at that time, this sort of pre uh, make, who would make this stuff at the time, kind of back in the 90s, it was quite hard to find people who can make this stuff in the UK. So we actually went to a timber kitchen fit-out company who built it all for us, fabricated it in the factory. And the whole, I think the whole project was completed in a couple of months. I think we start to finish. It was a really fast track. Again, it's still standing today, well loved. And I think, again, the kind of atmosphere in the building, which I'll come on to later, is, is very kind of relaxing and conducive to kind of calm thought. Again, <laughs> We've always been interested in trying to push the boundaries and explore what materials, uh, what natural materials we can kind of bring into mainstream construction. This is a project in Taunton in Somerset, which was completed maybe uh, eight, nine years ago now, uh, where we had a fantastic brief where they were actually interested in, in kind of within one building trying out and, uh, the, how you could use as many different natural materials as possible. So we got to kind of experiment with straw bale, cob, rammed earth, clay box, all sorts of different construction techniques 
And again, I think the thing that really strikes people about the interiors is just how beautiful they are. You know, when you see the kind of wonderful surface and the round earth, or from the clay plasters, they're kind of fantastic finishes. And again, gradually scaling up over time, uh, this is then moving into schools. So we kind of moved from the source scale project up into building um, kind of public sector projects. So this is one of our schools in Wolverhampton. We built a number of schools in Wolverhampton, sort of building on the uh, ethos of the kind of Walters Eagle construction, sort of scaling it up to kind of public building scale. So again, it's sort of timber frame. It's using sort of cellulose-based insulations uh, and timber cladding at a large scale to create a kind of school environment. And it's kind of trying to rethink in tie the building about where we would normally use a synthetic material, where we, people would conventionally specify synthetic material, is there some kind of bio-based natural substitute for that that can work as effectively? Um, you know, the important point, so we talked about kind of regulations and fire, obviously all these buildings have to meet the building regulations, they have to uh, kind of pass all the standards, but it is possible to challenge that right down to details of, you know, the handrail of dado, so we try and never use UPVC dado in our buildings if we possibly can, uh, through to little details, through to the kind of acoustic absorbers, other alternatives to so kind of typical kind of plastic vinyl based uh, options, see the sort of timber de uh, dado details. Um, so it's kind of trying to think through in terms of construction. And I think Tom sort of suggests this idea that, you know, architects generally aren't interested in how things are made. I and mean, we're finding now, you know, just about every building that we uh, come across is built with Metsec, whack on some PIR, slap something on the outside. We're kind of really passionate about which I think most architects really like to be, we really want to know how it's made, really interested in how it's made, because I think that's how you kind of control the impacts and kind of quality of your building. So this is Coy de Brennan in Mid Wales, in Dolgathlai, uh, near Dol just north of Dolgathlai, uh, which is kind of forest visitor centre. And on this project, we worked with uh, 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 Coy de Cymru to develop a kind of Brett panel. So it's like how you actually make the building out of natural materials. So these are non-glue bonded kind of CLT alternative, where with all with local timber from the local Welsh forests, where you use the, you have to get the moisture content of the uh, wood in the soft wood panels just right, and the moisture con content in the hardwood dowels just right. You insert them at angles and the whole thing kind of sets effectively as the, as the kind of moisture uh, stabilizers. But again, they also produce a great interior, which is kind of really full of life and warmth and of the, of the environment that the building's in. And this has kind of moved through into kind of moving into different sectors gradually. So the Herefordshire Archive record building. Um, again, trying to run through in terms of the interiors, how we can use natural materials. Uh, hospice environments, again, you sort of mentioned hospice environment. This is kind of really important consideration with the healthcare. Uh, we're doing a lot of kind of um, extra care residential schemes as well. That's a really important kind of factor in terms of the kind of quality of the internal environment. And through to... Uh, this is a recently completed project in Highgate, which is a new junior school at Highgate. So again, different kind of building, different kind of context, but we're still trying where we can to kind of exploit the benefits of natural materials. I just put this up because this is uh, quite exciting. So this is a, a project for Russ in Lewisham, which is kind of building on the archetypes uh, original work with Walter Siegel. So this is a self-built multi-residential scheme um, in Lewisham, which has just gone in for planning, which again is a kind of timber frame solution. So over the years, we've kind of been scaling up the kind of buildings we, we've been doing, but we've been really trying hard to kind of stay true to the kind of roots of the original kind of inception practice and, and kind of exploring how we can take those ideas about kind of natural building materials through into these bigger projects. And so this is an example which is a fantastic uh, opportunity for us, uh, where the unit working for the University of East Anglia, um, they had actually been doing a lot of research when they kind of started doing this project. This is working for ADAPT, which is University of East Anglia's low carbon group. Uh, and they've been doing a lot of work on looking at local supply chains within East Anglia and what the opportunities were of using local materials within a new kind of major building on the UAA campus. Again, UEA had largely been focused on kind of operational energy up to this point. They've got a fantastic heritage of uh, low energy buildings. Uh, but what they wanted to do is kind of combine that with both looking at the embodied energy uh, of the materials in the, in the project, uh, say, been using Termodec up to date and a lot of concrete, and also looking at the kind of health effects and the kind of whether they could source those materials locally. So if people are familiar with the UEA, 
we are up here. So this is kind of an extension of the Lasden campus down here, Foster's building. This is kind of new kind of building coming in on University Drive. Uh, Earlham Hall, which is a kind of listed uh, Norwich building is kind of over here. So it was a kind of bit of an expansion with the university out of their kind of normal zone on a brownfield site. And the, bri the brief from the university was for uh, passive house building, uh, BRIAM outstanding, uh, bio-based materials, low embodied carbon, zero carbon if possible, soft landings, I think, uh, it went to, the list went on. Um, so right at the outset of the project, we were kind of looking at what of the kind of systems we'd already been developing using in our previous projects could we kind of bring forward and apply within this project. So we kind of looked at the idea of could we build it at Brett Staple? Turned out that was too expensive. There's lots of timber kind of available in East Anglia. Um, uh, not necessarily uh, kind of traditional species you might use in construction, things like Corsican pine, uh, which is available, which is very good construction wood. Uh, we looked at the kind of Larson Trust system we've been developing with our Passive House projects, which is basically a kind of timber stud frame, the kind of extended OSB plates, uh, a kind of all cellulose external wall construction system, and then looked at ideas about kind of cladding and uh, trying how that could kind of relate to the local context. And then similarly in terms of the interiors, so see that these are some of the interiors of the schools we've been working on. So it's like how could we take some of the kind of expression of natural materials through into this building. And this is a kind of palette. Nice photo taken with the AJ of the material palette. <laughs> uh, we had to get the thatcher to send the reed, especially in a black bin bag. But uh, uh, you can see the kind of uh, hazel kind of rods, the thatching. You can see the kind of clay plasters, uh, kind of wood fibre boards, cellulose, uh, kind of spray on insulation. Um, kind of natural MDF, well, kind of MDF external cladding boards. So, and at a very early stage of the project, we were interested to investigate where could you actually get local materials from. So, there's actually a, a lot of materials that are available within the region. I mean, it, there's a big challenge here, of course, uh, in terms of getting those materials into a large scale construction project. Uh, so we didn't succeed on everything. Uh, we were keen to use hemp as an insulant because that is grown locally. It just was too expensive uh, to make that happen. So uh, in the end, we had to use uh, kind of cellulose blown insulation. That, interestingly, was, was warm cell. Uh, warm cell went bust, which is, again, part of the story, as we're hearing today, lots of these natural insulant providers, I don't know what it says about the UK, um, all going bust. Uh, but we managed to get the last warm cell in the UK into this project uh, from, from kind of South Wales. I think it's interesting to just point out that, that while some of these materials that we're talking about might seem maybe a bit unusual, we're talking about kind of low supply volumes of manufacturing in the UK going bust. When you look at the continent and you look at the USA, the kind of volumes there are enormous. And we were talking about in the USA market, like cellulose insulation is probably the number one insulation in, within kind of modern construction. But for some reason in the UK, we see these things as sort of strange and unusual. So I touched on the client. So ADAPT uh, had been done a, doing an interesting research project uh, looking at a kind of woodland resource within the region. Um, uh, it's interesting to say that, you know, again, the barrier here was really about supply chains. So when you look at kind of raw, bring these raw materials into the building, the whole of the forestry supply chain in Sangli was set up to provide wood pulp and, forest and, and fence posts, essentially. Uh, so to kind of actually get anybody interested in supplying timber for construction project was quite difficult. But in the end, we managed to do it working with our timber frame uh, subcontractor. Uh, and we managed to get kind of Corsican pine to form the majority of the of this kind of structural timber frame within the building. The, the thatch, which is the kind of probably the kind of thing that people kind of recognize when they see the building. Uh, this came out of, uh, this was the kind of article that came out at the time we were looking at the original design is this kind of return to of thatching and interest in thatching. And we worked with the kind of the master thatcher of East Anglia, uh, a guy called Stephen Letch, who um, was a fantastic guy. He's really inspired by kind of contemporary thatch projects in Europe. And that sort of led on to a kind of really simple kind of concept about the idea of this sort of thatch building with this hovering roof as you enter the university. Uh, I mean, we're quite clear this is a kind of one-off project. It meets the brief. We wouldn't like to suggest that every building in the UK, you know, this is a very specific kind of thing. It's 
isolated its uh, two-storey building, its uh, commercial use, uh, it's kind of all fire engineered properly, and it, and it makes a strong statement about the region and and the kind of and how fantastic these natural materials can be visually. These are some of the kind of uh, very difficult to represent some of these materials in in visualizations we found. Everybody just looked at it and said, "Oh, it looks like concrete." Whoops, hang on, this strange thing, quite tricky. Uh, it's a passive house building, which is not the kind of focus of this talk, but in terms of kind of healthy environment, and um, we talked about air tightness and issues with air tightness. Obviously, if you've got an airtight building, you absolutely have to ventilate it correctly. It's a fundamentally important thing, and then everything will be fine. So this is the kind of diagram of how the building works in winter and summer. Obviously, you can also open the windows if you want to. Um, there's a kind of there's obviously the materials look fantastic, they're quite a wonderful environment, but also it, we had to prove the kind of carbon impact. So at the design stage, the university um, were very keen that that was actually kind of quantified and wanted to set actual kind of targets for the embodied carbon in the building. So they suggested using this, I don't know whether it even exists anymore, it's a few years ago now. Uh, we were developing this at the time, which is our own kind of in-house um, kind of modeling, early stage kind of building modeling tool. Uh, which also covers kind of embodied carbon. So we kind of use that, sped things up quite a lot at the beginning, and also enables to kind of optioneer and communicate to the client. And in terms, you can start to see here the kind of level of sequestered carbon within the different elements of the construction. That's uh, the very old equipment that's probably very carbon hungry, actually cutting the thatch of the building. And that's a prototype thatch panel with the hazel rods. That's four four sections of the corner section that are all coming together on the facade. And that's a thatch scarf joint that we developed. Talked about kind of the difficulty using kind of raw natural materials. This is uh, the timber from the local uh, forestry. Um, it's Corsican pine. It means that uh, it couldn't be stress rated by a computer, so it had to be stress rated by a guy who got brought out of retirement. And then it also means it can't be stress graded to the modern standards like C24. They're all slightly less, so it's C22, I think it's C14. So you end up having to then look at the whole engineering of the building to try and accommodate. This. Yeah, that's a good, this is in the old standards, yeah. So, uh, so all the structure engineering had to accommodate this. And also it has blue stains, so it kind of goes blue and it goes mouldy visually, but not, doesn't affect the structural performance of course combine. I'm going to skip through a few things here. This is the kind of reclaimed cladding. Again, talked about circular economy. This is the, uh, this is the old Lasden chemistry lab desk turned back into... Um, in, into cladding for the building. Again, the point here, again, it goes back to this sort of box ticking exercise. It's very difficult to get this through the BRE. There's no kind of certification for this or sourcing from it. It's Iroco, uh, but it's reclaimed and recycled and now doing a fantastic job on the building. So this is it under construction. So you can see it's just like a giant timber frame. A lot of consideration given to how the timber frame works in terms of the air tightness detailing, how it all comes together. And essentially, there's no kind of plastic membranes. There is a reasonable distance of air tightness tape, but uh, we've kind of limited that as much as possible. Uh, and we don't have kind of sheet membranes under the construction. That's the blue stain. And uh, talked about cellulose insulation. So this is kind of under construction. This is the cellulose insulation being kind of blown into the external wall envelope. I think. One of the points to pick up on in terms of the kind of PIR insolence is, you know, which is aside from health impacts, is, and it goes back to how well they work, is it's very, very difficult. You see any construction sites, it, there's always a gap. You just cannot get these bores to fit together properly. And that has a huge impact on the thermal in, uh, performance of the facades. You know, can, a five mil gap can kind of half the U value. So the idea is here by using a kind of blown system that you can actually get kind of full continuity of the insulation. And these are just some photos of the project, which I'm going to rattle through slightly. So externally, the thatch. I mean, again, the fantastic thing here is the materials just sort of shift and change with the light, and it's kind of alive, uh, which you don't get with so much with synthetic materials. And the contrast. The interior is really kind of a calm, uh, calm environment that feels really good. And I think one of the things that we've always felt of the is quite proud of an archetype is when you go into an archetype building, it sort of smells quite good on the first day it opens, which might seem like a minor point, but often when you go into a new building, it smells bloody awful. So we're quite proud of that. And I think people actually you know, really do react. And we've had a lot of um, really positive feedback uh, anecdotally from the building in terms of people, how they feel, how it works. We've had a full uh, proper kind of bus survey that's been carried out, and that puts it into the 
I think, 95th percentile uh, overall, sort of lecture theatre, uh, sort of cellulose insulation and spaces, and certificates. It's very fast bit. It works from an energy point of view, so it talks about kind of focus on energy, so we talked about things not meeting standards. This does meet the design standards, exceeds its design standards. It's better than we thought it would be in terms of its performance. It's half the next best building on the campus, which interestingly is Elizabeth Fry, which was built quite a long time ago, so the more recent ones haven't kind of even met that performance. And it saves a lot of carbon over the life cycle, but a life cycle by pursuing this approach to materials. So you can see that impact of materials on day zero here, that's a kind of typical building. That's, your, uh, that's the kind of low carbon specification. You can see that uh, you're kind of starting much lower down the curve. So people have kind of said things anecdotally, really enjoy having lectures. It, the building's really calm. And similarly, the RIBA judging panel, when they went round, said it exudes a sense of calm. I go there. I feel calm. And I don't know whether that's because I'm just relieved that it's finished. It could well be a quite a bit of that. But I do truly believe it does feel very calm. So the question is, is there any evidence for that, really? So there's a kind of growing field of environmental psychology looking at how people kind of interact and respond to their, with their environment. Uh, there's kind of ideas like biophilic design, which sort of suggests there's an innate connection between people and their environment. Uh, uh, but I think sometimes that can lead people to sort of slightly surface kind of solutions. So you see a lot of kind of slightly dead moss panels on walls people kind of putting pot plants in, or maybe kind of 2D representations of nature. I think we're much more interested in, can you actually embed nature into the architecture? Some great research in Canada on this, done by the University of British Columbia at FP Innovations, looking at wood and human health. So this is a study where they built four office environments. Uh, they put, one had wood, one had wooden plants, one was kind of fairly sterile. They put 119 students, one after the other, into these environments and made them do a mass test. And they looked at their uh, kind of vital signs and kind of stress levels. And you can see consistently within the wood interiors, uh, people felt more relaxed, which is quite interesting. Um, what about the marks? How did they perform? <laughs> well, I, that they didn't say. Uh, interesting question. But, you know, th there's a lot of research being done then about it within healthcare environments particularly, but those would kind of relate in a way to all kind of workspaces, uh, you know, in terms of kind of better productivity, less illness, more creativity. So we're doing a lot of research at Archetype. Uh, trying to understand, uh, a bit like Tom was talking about, you know, what do all these individual materials do, and trying to build our own kind of restricted list so that all our architects know when they're specifying something. If it's got HBCD in it, they're aware of it, and they know that there's a health risk, and then that they have the tools and resources available to communicate to clients that this is a problem. Because, uh, you know, we find that if we have to research this every time and explain to clients, it's obviously quite a, a, a big burden, but we want to make that more efficient um, through kind of software tools. We're also doing our own research, so I'm just kind of coming to the end now, but this is working with UCL. Uh, we're doing a kind of PhD. Um, uh, we've got a PhD student working with us, looking at our, our kind of material specification and trying to validate that in terms of the indoor um, kind of health and climate. So it's particularly kind of VOCs. I think the most interesting thing about that, that we, is that you, know, you talk about VOCs as a kind of generic thing, but within VOCs, there's a whole range of different chemicals, maybe thousands of chemicals. And they all have different health impacts. And it's quite hard to actually measure uh, the individual con constituent chemical components of VOCs. So this is something we're trying to uh, explore through this research. Uh, so you've got, I think one of the interesting things, like the kind of literature out there, is that uh, if you look at, there's a study, I think it was done in 2013, yeah, Sonitel, which uh, looks at the fact that certain things coming off from lumber, well, they do emit VOCs, so timber products do emit VOCs. Some of those compounds might actually be beneficial for the human body. Uh, other, sta other studies say maybe not. So there's a bit of contradictory information out there. Uh, plywood emission rates are much less than, than solid uh, uh, timber. Um, and, uh, you know, so the question is, you know, can we prove, really, that the kind of specification we're using? So we've, we've got a lot of evidence now on energy, but we're now trying to explore how the materials can actually affect the indoor uh, kind of health and environment that people are actually living and learning in. Okay. Thank you very much. Fantastic. You can feel kind of racing through a little bit there because we obviously have a little bit of time presses, but that, that's fantastic, inspiring stuff. And um, you know, we can move straight on. If I just go out of this, do I go out of this one? You're the same presentation, are you? There we go. Great. 
Um, <coughs> thanks for the right information. Um, Alex Sparrow, Director of UK Hempcrete, leading advisor on the use of hemp line. So over to you, Alex. Uh, yeah, so I'd just like to echo the, the uh, comments of the previous speakers and thanking Tom uh, for the, being the genesis of this event and the Building Centre for putting it on. Um, I think it's really important uh, still <laughs> to, uh, to have these events which focus on what is basically a, a sort of challenger technology, if you like, um, perhaps borrowed from previous centuries, uh, but very much a, a, a valuable thing to be talking about when it comes to challenging the, the kind of conventional status quo using synthetic materials. So I'm, I'm the token builder, I think, on the, on the panel. Um, so I'm very much coming uh, to talk to you um, from a very practical sense um, about the use of these materials. So um, I'm the director of UK Hempcrete Limited and previously had a company called um, Hemp Lime Construct. Um, and we're predominantly a specialist contractor using, al although the hempcrete is in the title of the company, uh, we, we use a, a range of um, natural and complementary materials. Um, so uh, hempcrete, um, timber frame, lime, both in uh, coatings and in mortars of any masonry we do, and in uh, floor uh, slabs. And also a range of natural fibre insulations, both um, board, uh, varieties and also in um, uh, quilt and uh, bat insulation. Um, so that's the main um, uh, bulk of what we do. We've also recently started to supply the materials that we use to other contractors and we also um, uh, get called on to do training um, both for um, individual self-builders but also for people within the industry. So. Um, how does that sort of take shape? What does it look like? So um, I'm going to go on to show you hopefully some practical examples in photographs. But basically what we're talking about is we are, um, we, our, our company specialises in the structural and thermal envelope of your building from uh, natural, renewable or recycled materials. Um, so looking at hempcrete particularly, um, probably the most common thing we're asked to do is to um, put hempcrete uh, in the walls of the building. Practically every building we do is, has a structural timber frame. Um, and when we get into commercial, that's a, a little bit different. Um, so we can also have hempcrete in the walls and uh, hempcrete as part of a vapour permeable um, insulated floor build-up. Um, occasionally, in fact we're doing one at the moment, quite a large uh, new build house in Scotland, which has the whole thermal envelope from hempcrete and when you're casting hempcrete on site for those of you who don't know hemp, hemp I should just say that hempcrete or hemp lime is a mixture of um, the chopped up woody stalk of the hemp industrial hemp plant which was previously considered a waste material um, mixed wet mixed with a lime binder and usually cast on site in either into formwork or spray applied around a structural frame okay um, so one of the advantages when you're casting hempcrete on site is once you've constructed your structural frame for the building, you're then casting the whole building on site, the whole thermal envelope, as one piece of material. So the only, um, uh, there are no thermal bridges uh, because you've cast the hempcrete around the structural frame and the only junctions with other materials are at any openings in the envelope. Okay, and the, the, the normal finish as we'll go on to look at is a lime render um, external coating. So once you've rendered the outside of that single piece of material, uh, you've made it completely airtight without the need for any membranes or um, tapes. Tape. Sticky tape, yeah. The only time we use the tiki tacky is if we're using um, uh, a wood fibre, a wood fibre, sorry, a timber cladding um, finish externally which obviously requires a vented cavity underneath. So at that point, the hempcrete within that vented cavity needs sealing to make it airtight. So the, uh, the, the most sustainable way of doing that, uh, and, and I would argue the, the best longevity-wise, would be to put a rough coat um, render on, or a base coat render on underneath, and then fix your cladding battens onto that. But for reasons of uh, budget, budgetary constraint, we do occasionally use a membrane over the surface of the hempcrete 
inside timber cladding, but that's the only time. Um, so more commonly, perhaps, some, some people do go the whole hog, uh, but more commonly we might be using hempcrete in combination with uh, another natural fibre insulation between the rafters, so that might be a sheep's wallet, it might be hemp fibre, might be a recycled timber insulation, or, or indeed blown cellulose. Um, and then over the top, um, a wood fibre sarking board um, that uh, gives you both extra insulation, stops thermal bridging through the rafters, and gives you that good degree of air tightness over the, the roof because of the interlocking nature of the boards. And commonly we'd use that on a, on a hempcrete roof as well, so we'd fill the hempcrete between the rafters, and then we'd have the wood fibre boards over the top. And because hempcrete um, sets, and because of the lime binder, it's a very hard sort of re you know, medium density material. So it's about, in roofs, it's about 200 kilos per cubic metre. Um, that gives you a really solid surface. So when you screw that board down, um, you get very good airtight seal at the eaves. Um, and then this is the last one is just to demonstrate that probably more often than hempcrete in the floor, we're using a, um, a, an insulated lime, um, lime sand screed. So um, there's a couple of systems on the market, but usually there's um, uh, a fo recycled foam glass um, insulating gravel layer, which is also a non-wicking capillary break layer, if you like, which extends up to external ground level so that any groundwater that comes in at the side can, as liquid water can only drain down, but it's vapour open. And then on top of that, you have a geotextile membrane and then a... a lime sand screed with your underfloor heating pipes in and then whatever floor finish you like on top. So um, that's basically where my, where my client base comes from. Okay? Um, I, never, the people, I never have to sell hempcrete, okay? partly because it says it on the tin of my company. So when people find me, they've already, they've already made that decision, really, to use hempcrete. But the, I see it as a simple Venn diagram. So people are either, I think, uh, I, I've seen over the last 10 years the, the sort of explosion, really, of awareness, um, certainly in, in the public at large, despite the best efforts of the chemical companies, as Tom was saying earlier, um, this huge explosion in, in people's understanding about the toxicity of the materials that we're putting into our new buildings. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we've done four or five houses in the last few years for doctors um, because I think there's this huge awareness of, of um, health or, or otherwise that we're creating by uh, the choice of materials that we use in the building. Um, so either people are coming from a health and well-being, natural, chemical-free point of view. Hempcrete, um, uh, as I said earlier, talk about was the fact that, that hempcrete using lime as a binder uh, basically becomes naturally rot resistant because lime is a powerful antifungal agent. It's completely pest resistant. Nothing eats lime. They've taken a block of hempcrete and put it in a termite's nest and the termites did this thing where they excrete a substance to cover the block in to isolate it from their nest and then just left it well alone. So, um, and, uh, and it's also, as Tom demonstrated earlier, uh, impossible to set fire to it. You can uh, expose it to very extreme... Uh, Fight, you know, flames, and basically over time it chars. Um, and there's no chemicals in there to off gas. Um, otherwise, people are coming because they are very interested in the low impact nature of the material. Um, not, haven't got time to go into it in depth, but remarkably, considering that the binder is building lime, which is a relatively high embodied energy material because it's mined and burnt in a kiln, uh, the the huge um, absorption of atmospheric CO2 by the hemp plant, which grows very quickly and creates a very hard woody stem, which is the part of the plant that we use in the building. Um, uh, the, the actual absorption of CO2 by the hemp means that as a material, hempcrete is um, better than zero carbon. So we're sequestering about 100, 150 kilograms of atmospheric CO2 in every cubic metre um, in, in every building that we build. And then the other route in is often people who um, have come into uh, 
the, uh, the hempcrete world through um, owning an old building and trying to find something that's going to effectively be applied as a retrofit insulation to maintain the vapour permeability of that building. So, what does it look like in practice? Uh, so, uh, this is a, a photo which I wish had a bit more of this building in because it's quite nice. Um, but this is three hempcrete buildings at various stages. Um, this is a kind of... Um, uh, this is timber frame with a full cast hempcrete wall um, and then timber clad finish, which is a sort of annex building that the clients are now living in while we take the rest of their house apart. And then this is a rebuild of a garage, which is a hempcrete um, with a line render fi ooh, finish, as you can see. And uh, this, in, this, in the case of this building and this building, they're a composite um, wall system of hempcrete, precast hempcrete blocks on the internal uh, skin tied back to the timber frame and then with cast hempcrete around the outside. Um, this one is insulated at uh, um, ceiling level and then this is a this is a bat loft, which is why that strange detail up there. This is a hempcrete extension, would you believe? That's the original house up there. Um, so we've sort of doubled the size of their house really. Again, hempcrete and timber frame, cast, cast on site hempcrete um, and lime render finish. Um, we also used hempcrete as, a, as a, a solid wall insulation in the original um, old stone cottage um, to improve the uh, thermal performance of the whole. That's it. Yeah, so that's a, sorry, that's passive stack ventilation systems uh, by a company called Ventiv, um, which, uh, yeah, it, as uh, someone just said, it's very important when you're making a, an airtight building to ventilate it effectively, and that's a heat recovery ventilation system. Uh, a little bit com overcomplicated, in my humble opinion, having fitted it. So each of these stacks is ventilating a different part of the house, um, and it was a bit of a challenge to, to, to get all of the pipes and things into the right place, and I'm, I'm a little bit sceptical of their um, efficiency stats, but hey. Uh, this is another new build um, hempcrete building with a very, uh, I still get tired looking at that photo, with a nine metre high cast hempcrete tower. And this one has an internal um, uh, frame, internal timber frame with a permanent shuttering board on the inside, which is a board that Tom and I both know well, called a uh, multi-pro resistant board, which was specified by a particular hempcrete manufacturer a few years ago. And uh, I haven't included the nasty photos of it with covered in black mould because it doesn't uh, take well to, to liquid water drying through it. Uh, that's the same building which we've been putting a, a render on recently. Um, so again, lime render finish. Um, you know, it's um, in terms of complementary materials that 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 you know, other than the res multi pro resistant board. You know, you're looking at slates, um, natural slates, uh, lead, timber. Hempcrete, lime, okay, there's a concrete block uh, upstand there, but um, in general, um, th those, those materials, when we get onto looking at the, the retrofit stuff that we do, those materials are the same materials that have been used in buildings for the last 500 years in this country, really. Um, this is a rather odd-looking house that we did a few years ago in Bristol. A uh, bit of a strange design, but this is just to demonstrate, again, so this both of these uh, um, uh, sides of the house are... Uh, built from hempcrete, this one obviously with a local stone uh, cladding using a lime mortar, um, and then on the other side, the more, more usual lime render finish. Um, so again, I quite like this. I like the, the um, sort of half clad uh, thing. So again, this is uh, because he changed his mind on the last bit. Uh, you can actually see the detail that was used there. So we've got a central um, structural frame and then a, a secondary cladding frame built off, uh, off it at the first floor level to give a fixing for that um, timber, timber cladding. That's the same house rendered. Um, this is my, they usually look happier than that. This is a couple of my guys. It's because I've, I've stopped them working to take the photo. Um, so this is a new build house we did in Suffolk last winter. And increasingly, so one of, one of the issues with cast on site hempcrete, it's, you know, basically for up to, up to the size of a new build, you know, a single domestic property, uh, I would always cast on site. Um, when when that becomes an issue is that the, 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 there's two, there's only two difficulties, right, with cast on site hempcrete. One is the lack of skilled contractors nationally, 
Um, and then the other one is um, drying times on site. So we've had in the uh, in the past in this country, we've we've got to the point of building sort of you know 60, 120 um, houses in developments out of cast on site hempcrete, and it's basically been proven that the drying time is is just too unpredictable for large scale projects because it will cause um, uh, potentially cause issues with schedules. So what we've started doing, and this is partly so that we can carry on working through the winter without slowing down people moving in. We've started doing a, a, a hempcrete precast hempcrete block internal skin, and then uh, at, so that the frame is still central within the wall, but it's offset. So the in, inner 200 mil is this uh, um, precast block skin with laid in a lime mortar, and then the outside 200 mil is cast hempcrete cast around and between the frame. And what that means is that you can move in, fit the inside out as soon as the bedding mortar's dry and uh, start using and heating the building, whereas you've now only got 200 mil of hempcrete to dry on site, and it's on the outside of the wall where the sun and the uh, wind um, aid that process. That's the house uh, nearing completion, and then up, uh, this is the um, wood fibre interlocking sarking board on the roof, and under that there's 200 mil of um, hemp fibre insulation. Um, and that's the same house. Now, we, are, we didn't get the rendering, so I have no information as to why there are no sills. Uh, it's not a usual detail, even in Suffolk, I believe. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, Tom very nicely um, plugged my book earlier, um, but this is a, um, a house that was built at, uh, the people who heard of the Graven Hill demonstrator site in Bicester. So there's a guy there, Paul, who um, uh, bought our book and came on one of our two-day training courses and then went off and built himself a hempcrete house pretty much by himself, uh, despite the fact he's a human rights lawyer with no previous building experience. Um, he had a, a carpenter friend to help him with the frame and he got a load of students to help him with the hempcrete. And uh, he's one of the four, no, one of the first, I think he was probably the first person to take up their plot at Graven Hill, which is where they're, for people who don't know, the um, Bicester Council have bought a bit of XMOD land and they've made 2,000 self-build plots available. So they're self-building a town. Um, and these, the first 10 are being followed on a special grand design. So you'll, at some point you'll see it on the telly. Uh, then this is the other half of what we do, um, is kind of retrofitting insulation to uh, um, old buildings. Again, not, not exclusively hempcrete, um, but this is an example, pretty standard example of what we do. So. This is hempcrete infill to an old um, uh, Elizabethan tithe barn which, with an elm frame, which was um, pretty conclusively damaged. It had been, obviously, wattle and daub up until the 1960s, when someone had helpfully rendered it with cement instead of lime. And by the time we got to it in, the, in 2011, um, there was, I think, that all of the wattle and daub, I think there's maybe half a panel that still had some original wattle and daub in it, and it was cement render on metal lath and nothing else in there. So we hempcreted the whole of uh, those panels and then finished them with a lime render. Um, similar deal, this is a Tudor um, hall house with a later um, oak extension, which was previously thatched and had caught fire. And so uh, as part of the um, uh, re reconstruction process, you decided to get rid of the, the uh, polystyrene stroke bubble wrap stroke rock wool infill that had been finished with hardwood and hardboard and um, s uh, metal lath and cement render and uh, hempcreted the whole thing and again you know we're, we're builders so we don't get the opportunity people are welcome if they want to come and put monitoring into these buildings that we're building all the time but so far we haven't had anyone do that um, but we get rely on anecdotes from clients and so her comment was uh, that Prior to the fire, she, had, she could only afford to heat three rooms in the house. Having hempcreted the whole lot, uh, she now heats the whole house and uses a third less oil than she was using before. So she has, in the interest of full disclosure, she has had a new uh, oil boiler as well. But as, even so, I think, speaks for itself. Same thing again, fire-damaged house with a new... Um, uh, New, brand new uh, oak frame with hempcrete panels in. That's the inside of that room up there. So again, just showing the lime plaster um, finish. 
uh, just to show it's not just all big you know, manor houses that we work on. So this is a humble terraced house in Oxford and uh, three photos of the same house showing um, this is actually, we would normally, um, for, for thin layer applications, for solid wall insulation, we'd normally spray because it's just a much more cost-effective solution when you're only doing a, th a small layer. But the actual, the actual length of the lance when you're spraying hempcrete is too uh, cumbersome to get into the um, uh, alleyway there. So this is cast hempcrete. Solid wall insulation again, finished with a lime render, which don't think looks too out of place against us. And interestingly, that gable wall um, was a single skin brick wall, um, which I think there's a, probably a few of lurking around in our town centres. So actually, the, the casting of the hempcrete up here has probably given a bit of structural uh, 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 sort of um, structural substance to it as well. This is internal solid wall insulation. Uh, in a, a converted barn in Yorkshire, um, in uh, with again with hempcrete and a lime render finish. Um, and this is uh, internal um, solid wall insulation at uh, um, the new offices of a firm of architects that we work with quite a lot. And uh, because this this panel here was going to be in their meeting room, I decided we it was we ought to have a flash truth window so that you could see the hempcrete behind the uh, lime plaster so that when their clients come in and sit down, they, they say, oh, what's that material there? Um, just me, we do do, we're not, we don't do a huge amount of commercial work, but we do um, do some sort of design and build stuff, subcontracting with, um, with on bigger commercial sites. And so this is, a, this is a sort of build on site prefab system which I would imagine Tom would approve of because it hasn't been off site manufactured. So this is hempcrete so this is within a steel frame building, um, timber cassettes built within the bays of the steel, filled with hempcrete blocks, and then on the outside, uh, covered over with wood fibre to take in the steels and the, the timber cassettes, uh, which in the case of this building is then, there's two finishes, so the side is going to be rendered down here, and then the, the gables are brick clad, and that's the completed building. Um, and this one is not our build, actually. We just supplied the materials for it. But this is um, uh, William's Den, which is a new ch um, children's play barn in North Yorkshire, um, which is hempcrete block uh, up to this level, and then uh, wood fibre insulation. Um, and that's the finished building. And I usually have a slide, which I haven't I've just realised I haven't put in today. But the, the theme of William's Den is that it's a natural... Um, risky adventure play place for children. It's not just inside, I might add, there's a lot of outside bits as well. So inside there's this whole adventure play area with, with water falls that they can run under and it's all made from old trees and, and natural materials, which is uh, quite fantastic. So where have we got to then? Nearly at, nearly at an end. So successes. We've been building with hempcrete in the UK now for 18 years and that's continuing to, there's been sort of ups and downs in the market and uh, people have come and gone, but the, um, it's driving continued in innovation, really, which is really positive. Um, there's been a huge um, explosion of interest in hempcrete, but also in natural materials generally over the last few years, and that's really positive. Obviously, we're, we're only a small company, um, or a very small company, pretending to be a small company, um, but it's, it's clear to me which direction the market's going in, which can only be a positive thing. Um, current challenges, as other speakers have said, um, most of the, the, um, most of the uh, products that are manufactured are manufactured in the EU. Um, you know, Brexit is, is up nearly upon us. Uh, we need to get it sorted out. Um, as I said before, um, that, you know, as Tom's proven, actually, with the, with the building in Dublin, ca cast on site can be done in commercial buildings. It just needs a, a bit of skill knowledge in the scheduling and, and, and the, um, uh, you know, the uh, kind of uh, making, the, making the project happen and con allowing for the drying time within it. Um, I think the next steps, really, we need to look at, at ways that we can upscale and use for scale builders to be using natural materials in a, in a basically in a hempcrete product that is uh, precast, in my opinion. Um, 
and, and really, I've been saying for a few years, you know, that the reason there's nothing manufactured in the UK is that the regulatory framework that's handed down to us by government is, you know, possibly being influenced by uh, chemical companies who are producing the synthetic insulations. But whatever the reason, it's not giving the security to companies to start up and get investment to manufacture eco-materials here. We only have to look across the channel to see the difference, really, because environmental product declarations are, a, are the norm over there. They've got huge investment in the materials uh, that we are then importing into the UK, and that's only going to make our market, our products more expensive in the UK market if uh, the economic trends continue uh, the way they have been. So um, thanks for listening, and uh, if any, I've, as ever, I've left my business cards in... Uh, in Derbyshire, so if anybody wants to get in touch, start scribbling now. <laughs> yeah, okay. Great. Uh, I'm going to move straight on um, to Fran Bradshaw. Uh, Fran is another architect who can speak for us. Uh, she's a partner in Anne Thorne Architects. She's architect of the Eco Hub Haringey and the Hickling House Norfolk, and will take us through some of these projects. Thank you. Thanks very much for asking me. <coughs> um, so, um, I'm, there's a bit of a grand title, but actually I'm going to focus on a couple of projects, which is about straw bale. Not because I think straw bale is um, better than any of these other materials or more. Um, I think materials are, have to be suitable to the place and the situation and the building. And there's a whole lot of very complex um, stuff that goes into how you go about thinking this is the kind of way we're going to work with this project. Um, and I also think that building work and building projects, have always, there are always dangers and there are, um, there are, I don't think I've come across any project that doesn't use something that isn't pretty bad for you somewhere. And, and, and you know, obviously we all, those of us working in this area, try and use as many products as, that we think aren't going to hurt people. But, um, or nature. But um, I'm really not into kind of high moral tone about it. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated business. And um, I think what Tom's really, you know, what I really appreciate is that Tom's one of the people who've been trying to show us over such a long time how difficult it is because there are very, very powerful forces um, who are trying to make it difficult and to make sure that we don't know the kind of information that we really need to know and um, to keep us in quite an ignorant place, really. And I think it's our responsibility as designers and builders to try and find out and be as well informed as we can. So thanks to Tom and the others who've been trying to give us that information for a very long time. Um, so I just wanted to start with this little building in um, Lordship Rec. Um, and the idea here is that it's in the middle of the park. So it's in the park surrounded by um, a sort of a, a very diverse community. Um, and so what was very important as part of the brief was to bring together the community and for them to be involved and to participate in the building. And that led us on to the straw bale um, Thing. And what's brilliant about the way that um, straw works, uh, work with straw, is that um, you only need like one or two people who really have done it before and know what they're doing. Um, and they can then um, bring volunteers. And you all think that you know what you're doing until suddenly the straw works people aren't there. And then you realize you haven't got a clue. So it works very well um, with uh, a couple of very experienced craftspeople and a gang of volunteers who just need to be kind of willing and, fa and fairly practical. Um, so, so in a way, that was the motivation for this, this particular building method for this particular project. But what I noticed, um, so similar to some of the things that James was saying, is how much people liked the feeling of the building afterwards. And um, I was lucky to be about to build on a site in Norfolk. This is actually a conspiracy of the Norfolk Thatchers to take over the building industry. Um, 
And um, so completely different thing about context and materials and blah, blah, blah. So this is how I kind of ended up doing something um, you know, different in the way it looked from what we did in the middle of London. But um, uh, what I was wanted to do, and what you can do if you're building a house for yourself, which you can't do when you're working for public clients, is um, to look at how you could bring together these highly engineered products like passive house windows, which are you know, really wonderful pieces of very high-tech engineering that need to be perfectly plumb and level when they're installed. And um, what I think of as these very sophisticated materials, but which are actually um, natural materials that are really quite minimally processed. And that really was what I saw as the challenge for this project, was to bring them together um, and to produce a, you know, a, a low energy building. Um, so we used a um, primary timber frame um, and the thatch, uh, uh, the straw, and actually in the same way as we did in the hub, was built around it. Um, Obviously, you can use straw in lots of ways, and this is a, a sort of semi-load-bearing way. But what's very important in straw is that it's compressed, um, and you can pile up, um, you know, a pile of bales, and they're all kind of wobbly, and you think, oh my God, how is this ever going to be a wall? Um, but in the compress, so so what you're doing is um, compressing it, fitting in the last bale. Um, which was held between the, so the timber frame structure provided the compression plate uh, within which you could compress the wall. And what that means is that when it's rendered and clay plastered inside, it's um, the experience of, of, uh, of, and the tests that have been done show that actually fire is not a, a problem with this kind of straw because there's actually very little air in it. And um, I think that's very important to bear in mind when people talk about using straw in different ways, because it's not necessarily the case if it's, if it's used in a less compact form. Um, and the other thing about it is how it's baled. So you, you, in order to achieve the best insulation value, you, you want the straw to be vertical, not horizontal. And that is, depends on your farmer. And you need to know that your farmer knows how to um, get the tension right when they're bailing. So there are quite, you know, it's got its own technical requirements. And then we were bringing in um, uh, heat recovery ventilation systems, um, which have worked very well. Um, so, so actually, um, yeah, the challenge, the the work, it was a challenge to do that to bring together these complicated, these, you know windows and that it was a challenge but it was actually possible um, but what I want to go on to talk about now is um, oh well uh, is there anything that you we haven't already said oh just the, the thing about um, we've talked about airtight I think it's very important to separate airtight and moisture permeable um, and and those are the so when we're designing that's what we're looking for um, a good quality is good you know good um, uh, airtight construction, but vapor permeable construction, and I think that that's particularly important with old buildings. But actually, it's how we do new buildings as well. And it's a long time since I ever thought about doing anything else. Um, and it's good for us, but it's also good for the building. And if we want buildings to last well, I mean, I think we talked a bit about that earlier whether they do or not depends an awful lot on how we look after them and whether we provide the kind of environment that makes looking after buildings work well. So um, these kind of hygroscopic materials are very kind to the building as well as, as, well as to us. Um, embodied energy, I mean, I think it is really, uh, I really agree with them. Um, what James was saying, it's, it's, was it you? Somebody, yes, it was you. Um, you know, it's an increasingly big part. As you reduce the operational energy, the embodied energy becomes a much more significant part of the whole picture. And, um, but um, we used the concrete rafts because it was easy to air, 
to uh, insulate all around it. And we use foam glass, to, which is just a brilliant high-tech material to lift the um, straw bales off the ground. It was, it, it's in a kind of possible flooding kind of area. Um, but then, you know, obviously great gains with the straw and the thatch. So sort of swings and roundabouts. Um, and we, um, so we don't know enough about how straw bale functions. And in particular, we don't know about moisture performance through the wall. So we've got um, a whole load of sensors embedded in the wall. And we're tracking, um, in particular, how moisture moves through the wall. And the, um, the, it's looking, the sort of, um, yeah, so... What we're getting, first of all, it's telling us a bit about the buildings. They've got some very even temperatures. Um, and then you can sort of see how the temperature gradient get moves through um, the wall. So there's sensors going sort of from the inside to the outside. And the same about um, relative humidity. Um, it, it, it's, it sort of diverges in, into the winter as the sensors on the outside um, go up. So relative humidity is was pretty high and we, um, uh, we've got some sort of we've been monitoring for four years now so we're sort of seeing a general decrease so it's actually quite important to have data going over quite a long period because you put an enormous amount of water into the straw when you're um, rime, lime and clay plastering and it takes a really long time to get that all out of the, the building um, but the um, the, um, the the measurement of the the sort of timber equivalent moisture content um, measurement is, is looking quite good. We'll have, we're sort of doing that research, it's ongoing. And um, some funny things, I know, well, I think that's nothing sort of, it sort of tells us what we would expect there. Okay, so I then sort of got interested, um, again, rather similar to James, I got and we have got more interested in this thing about what people feel about the buildings. Again, say, similarly, the work we've done with schools, we've had anecdotal reports on um, children behaving, being calmer, behaving better, um, all sorts of odd things as we've gone through working on projects. Um, so in, in this particular project, um, I wanted to sort of just look a bit more at um, these aspects. And um, the first one is smell, like you say, the first thing you do when you go into and we, The thing is, we don't ever talk about um, the way that we sense buildings apart from looking. We say things like, oh, it's really lovely, or it feels really nice. Um, but our vocabulary, our general <laughs> vocabulary, with of course exceptions, is very focused on what it looks like. And... Um, so I think we're really profoundly influenced by the other senses, which we don't kind of really articulate. And um, so I, how does it smell? You know, I can't, couldn't quite think of a, anyway, I'm sure there must be some way to measure things, but um, yeah. Uh, but um, just interesting to, watch, to see what people say when you ask them. And then I... Uh, is, I really love this kind of quote from Considering the Five Senses. Um, tactility is the sense of closeness, proximity and effect. Eye touches the distance, but tactility sees the closeness. Doorknob is shaking hand to the building. I think that's a really lovely way of describing the way that you sense through your, through your hands. And um, I also like this one. Um, from the eyes of the skin, which um, talks about how the materials allow our vision to penetrate their surface and enable us to become convinced of the veracity of matter. Um, natural materials express their age and history. I think the, cha the way materials change is really important. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we have a sort of affinity for older buildings, that, they, um, that we see the, ma the materials in a different way. Um, and then um, I think it, in how we talk about light, there's a very big focus on the sculptural qualities of buildings. 
Um, and my feeling is that in, when you are inside a building, what you're aware of is how light is coming to you from different places so that you know, rooms that have light coming from two or three different places feel very different from ones where the lights all come from the same place, although if you measured it, you might get similar measurements. So I think it's a m more complex picture. And then I got really interested in acoustics because um, in, in general, when you move into buildings, they're very, you know, when there's no furniture, they're very echoey. And that's not the case with um, this kind of uh, building. And it's, I think, not the case with hemp um, and uh, other plant-based materials, or with timber for that matter. Um, so I, I sort of kind of thought, well, how, how do you explore this? Um, one of the things I realised is that um, musicians are very thoughtful about all of this, although they, most of their work is on very big projects. Um, and, um, but they do identify what are the kind of important qualities of, of space. And what I found was that uh, the internal um, big space in the house was a very good place for chamber music. Um, and that wasn't because I designed it to be like that. And it, so it made me think that these materials make it kind of much easier for us to um, create places that are, have these qualities that we can really enjoy. So um, what we looked at was um, um, measuring reverberation time. Reverberation time and, and um, the, the power of the sound, obviously, are what really uh, are the two sort of most measurable factors. Um, schools are one of, the, um, uh, one of the sort of few places where people are really concerned about acoustics. And obviously what they're... Um, concerned about is that, you know, intelli speech intelligibility, that people can communicate with each other. So that's, that's um, one side of it. Um, and so we, we started looking at reverberation time, and, and we found that um, the reverberation time was really quite kind of similar to the kind of requirements that um, people have for, for class, classrooms of the same sort of order of space. So... I found that quite interesting because um, with classrooms, we obviously think about designing the acoustic. You know, we're quite careful about that because you are very aware that there could be 35 children and you don't want it all to be very echoey. But in the case of my house, that wasn't really something I thought very much about. And we don't really with domestic spaces. But actually, what we've created here is something that has some of those um, same qualities. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued in this, um, our lack of kind of language to really describe how we perceive buildings. Um, and then the very last kind of, was a comment that sent to me quite recently, which I thought was really interesting, because it's about how we see buildings and the places that we um, inhabit as a, a sort of um, alive and... Um, part of a story of our lives part of, and of the, of, the, of the life of the building and um, I think that's something that we just have forgotten you know, people will talk to, you go to National Trust property or something and someone will tell you this story about all the people who live there and blah 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 but actually all the buildings we live in and, and, and work in and like being in have these stories and sometimes we know something about them and sometimes we don't but they do change, and really good buildings, and I think buildings that have, using some of this kind of way of thinking about developing them, are able to change and grow and tell stories about us, which are actually very important to us. Uh, well, I've, I've certainly enjoyed uh, all the talks and uh, many more questions, but really it's for you to ask some questions. So <coughs> if my colleagues around with the microphone, Harriet, do you have a microphone? Coming up now, and there's a question already lined up. I love that talk for the mixture of really, you know, 
graphs that I really couldn't read the detail of, um, but it looked, looked real, you really knew what you were monitoring. Uh, and then some beautiful quotes, uh, really poetic quotes that are inspiring too. So lovely range from that. Um, but here we are, I've got a microphone now. One is a, a question, the other is kind of an eco-activistic kind of a thought. Um, the examples that were given were all mostly in country-like surroundings. Um, shouldn't there be more of a focus on how to bring this into urban habitats, especially with more people moving to live in the cities? In other words, how can hempcrete and straw bale be used in an urban habitat, not just in, that, in the countryside? Um, and the second is the eco-activistic part is um, you used to go to places like EcoBuild where the true naturals used to be there. All of a sudden, you st now you start seeing more people in jackets and ties and all the corporations coming there. So it's almost like the corporations are taking over and giving a whole different, um, their viewpoint of what this is all about, which takes away the authenticity of what true natural buildings are all about. So shouldn't there be some kind of a movement or something being done to saying, wait a minute, it's not the corporations who are leading this, it's the individuals like Hemcrete and everybody else. amongst a group of other um, practitioners of natural building, including straw works, um, have been at um, EcoBuild over the years. Um, and w I would agree with you that over the years, it's got much more, uh, much less eco and more build. Um, uh, there may be, uh, come, come this March, because there's, I don't know if you're aware, but they've, they've had a management buyout of the company that puts on the show. And um, they have uh, expressed a, a firm desire with uh, the sort of regeneration of the show to put the sustainability back at the heart of EcoBuild, which uh, I, I guess means putting the money back at the heart of EcoBuild. But uh, I'm probably being a bit unfair there. Um, and certainly we're, we're going to be there in hopefully a bigger and better way this year and more at the heart of the show amongst lots of other um, like-minded individuals um, so I think there will be a different feel this year. Uh, and then your first point was, remind me, sorry, uh, it's about how to bring these different types of... Um, sure, yeah, we do, we do loads of work in um, cities. Um, so, yeah, yeah the, for example, well, I think the one of the biggest challenges uh, still at the moment is retrofitting um, uh, urban buildings. So particularly um, sort of leaky Victorian housing stock of which we have... Uh, a huge amount still, and we're still we're still going to have ninety percent of what we've got now in another thirty years, um, and that's I see that that particular area as the big challenge still, particularly because they tend to be owned by um, landlords um, or by uh, potentially by um, you know young couples who are just starting out and have children and move to bigger properties, or so in it's it's starting to change in the way that we're kind of costing in with the EPC uh, performance in, in buildings. But it, the big challenge for natural materials is um, finding effective ways to retrofit those buildings in an appropriate way, because most of those buildings are solid wall buildings that were built with lime mortars, and you need to maintain that vapor permeability. Um, and to retrofit those buildings in a way that is cost effective so that people do see the return on that investment, even if they're not staying in the property long term. Um, so quite agree with you. Yeah. So just to follow up from that, I guess there's the new well building standard, which a lot of people are getting into, mm -hmm. especially architects and that. And the single biggest challenge that every architect's facing today in the UK is on the solution side. Because unlike LEED and all the other ones, um, well is performance oriented. Either you meet it or you don't. Now, when you, so in terms of working with the architects is how can the suppliers of natural materials get more into the mainstream by saying, here we are? I think, I think just to pick up a point on that, I mean, just like on your first point you said originally, I mean, more than half our work's in a kind of urban setting. So we, you know, there are different challenges, but I don't think there's an inherently a barrier to kind of moving forward this agenda in an urban setting as well. And in, ter in terms of the kind of... Uh, working with uh, more natural or kind of uh, a kind of sort of less well-known materials i mean the big barrier then i think you alluded to it is you know in the end more and more we're expected to be able to back up stuff with proper testing uh, certification there's more and more barriers i mean a lot of them good like epd is a great idea but it's a huge cost to 
putting all that data in place, getting those tests done, and there's not that much support. So because we don't have, you know, the BRE isn't is no longer a public body. There isn't a kind of centralised uh, kind of uh, in building construction or building physics kind of institute that can kind of do that work and kind of promote these products to the industry. If you look at the continent, you know, the difference there is that there are those structures in place to support those products. So in the end, it comes down to kind of government policy fundamentally. Oh my God, it's mine. Question. Um, I have a question for Archetype. Um, you mentioned that you used in one of your projects an alternative to CLT, and further on, you also mentioned that you used Glulam. <coughs> What's your vision on these two um, products? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, hmm. I mean, I think fundamentally, <laughs> Uh, I mean, we, we really like timber construction. We're really interested in using it in all, in all forms. I think, uh, you know, glue, they all have their place and they all have their different kind of performances. So, uh, I mean, Brett Staple's very interesting in that it does remove the glues from the kind of, so essentially it's kind of a CLT-like panel without the glues. However, it doesn't have the same structural performance as a CLT panel, so you can't, there are limitations on that on how you can use it. I mean, again, it's used a lot more in kind of Austria than it is in the UK. Uh, it's also a lot more expensive. So one of the barriers, again, that we haven't talked about, but you know, we, it was alluded to in terms of cost. You know, so w looking at say the project that I talked about at UEA, uh, we had to deliver that within the kind of cost parameters of the project. So if you look at, for example, the glue lambs, we were trying to get those sourced in the region uh, uh, using kind of local manufacturers, and it was possible to do that, but the cost made it completely unsupportable within the frame of the project. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean I, again, I think, you know, there's a whole kind of range of different kind of timber technologies that can be used in different kind of contexts and settings, and it just depends on, on the kind of context, essentially, you know, which is the most suitable. I mean, one of the, I think one of the kind of interesting discussions that comes up around kind of something like CLT, for example, is around, um, you know, we've had kind of, interesting discussions on this in the office as well is this idea, particularly when you'll set a brief like UE, the UEA brief, which is make a building essentially a carbon sink, you know, is that then an excuse for kind of sloppy design in terms of you just try and pile in as much <laughs> timber bio-based material as you possibly can? Um, and I think there's a kind of balance to be struck there. So there's a danger, for example, you know, actually a kind of uh, timber frame kind of solution is incredibly materially, materially efficient. Um, so again, it's about using the different products where they where they're best suited within the construction. Yeah, I have a question up front. Um, in, term, in terms of um, durability for internal plastering, what what would you go for? Lime. I mean, you've you've got your hempcrete, which you can use for internal plastering, pres uh, presumably, and lime and clay. clay. And wi which yeah. which is which material has? Clay is a fantastic product for but, internal But quite, I don't quite difficult to use. Actually. <laughs> no? No, not no? Really. I don't know. No. I just wondered it's, because it's we've, talked, we've heard I about... I think that's apparently the only thing reason that not to use it. What's that? It's thicker. Otherwise, no, it's great. Clay, well, clay's, clay's a, clay plastering is very much a skill. Um, yeah. uh, and it, and yeah, as plastering we thought, is a skill. We, we, any plastering is a skill. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, the clay plastering in our, in our house was done by the, the plaster. He was all, he'd never done it before. He'd never done lime plastering on straw bale. He was just a good plasterer. He was really interested to do it. He said to me afterwards, I didn't like all that um, primary school stuff where you put the rubber gloves on and sort of push it into the straw. But after that, it seems I could get my walk out. I was happy as anything. And he did a lovely job. And it's, it's quite durable. Yeah, it's fantastic. I don't see. So anybody, anybody think of any reason why you wouldn't use clay plastering? No, yes. I'm just quite interested it's in it's between. It's just more the expensive. The well, 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 one of the one of the issues we we, we have used clay plasters on hempcrete. Um, if you're wet casting the hempcrete, you have to leave it a really long time to to dry because yeah. clay doesn't have a chemical set like lime or gypsum, so it it needs quite a dry background so that the moisture is pulled out to enable it to set. Um, other than that. Yeah, it's fine. There, there's, a, there's a wide variety. So you can, you, clay plaster c covers everything from digging yeah. a hole in the garden and, and yeah. sifting the, the earth and making the clay, mm -hmm. mixing in your own straw, 
um, to to a range of different clay plaster products, and they all behave yeah. uh, differently, and they're very you can get clay boards as well. And really so nice, really ones. nice to use yeah. in retrofit. All three Beautiful ones. colours. The colours just are fantastic. Uh, hemp, hempcrete, I should say, is not really a, a, a finish. Well, can be used as a finish, but hempcrete is more uh, of a sort of solid insulation material, which th you then I would see. apply a, a finished plaster to. You can have a, a lime plaster with a bit of hemp in it, or a clay plaster with a bit of hemp in it, to add uh, a bit of structure and insulation to the plaster. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask why why is brick less commonly used uh, in new buildings? If it's uh, you know when it's a natural material, it has a high thermal mass. Uh, it's a warmer material to use and it performs better in cold countries. So um, is there any specific brick. reason for that? Brick? Uh, yeah. I could Just speak personally. It doesn't <laughs> have very good insulation value. Yeah. So you need to come... Everything else is good about it. But um, yeah, it needs insulation uh, like all other materials, but does it not perform better in cold countries? Uh, no. Brick? Yeah. No, so brick. so brick brick has a lot of thermal mass and not very much insulation. So the, the closer to the equator that you are, the more you are reliant on thermal mass. Um, and the further away from the equator, the more interested you are in insulation. So brick is used quite a lot in new builds in this country, but it, it's combined with other insulations. And yeah, definitely. But uh, I didn't see any example in, uh, you know. Yeah, we, uh, we use brick quite a lot in, um, so as with any kind of natural building, um, system uh, we always build on a on a masonry upstand to keep the natural material whether that be straw or clay or or um, hemp off the ground mm -hmm. because none of those materials want to be sitting in groundwater so we, we commonly use brick either recycled or new brick um, as part of the insulated masonry upstand i think i think you know brick is is it has got its qualities and its great material i think the, the question the question that we'd be interested in, i mean a lot of our buildings have got brick cladding we haven't shown them today because it's kind of the talk was focused on natural materials particularly i mean bricks are fairly good from body carbon perspective the, uh, in terms of the kind of w worse aspect is actually the the mortar and how you stick them together basically from both from a kind of recyclability point of view and a carbon impact point of view so looking at kind of different technologies that enable you both to be able to demount it at the end and also reducing the embodied carbon. So thin joint systems, for example, can actually reduce the amount of some of some addition of material within the wall construction quite a lot. Um, so I think there are ways that you can work with brick that can make it more sustainable uh, than it is inherently. Um, so I, I, I don't think, I don't think there's like any question here about, as Fran was saying, about kind of necessarily ruling things out per se. Uh, th th here was just an exploration about kind of extending uh, the kind of opportunities that are there and showing that some of these, you know, technologies actually have been around for a very long time and are kind of ripe for rediscovery and they have a lot of fantastic properties, you know, particularly, as you were talking about, in terms of, you know, historical setting, you know, where a lot of modern building materials actually cause huge problems when they've been used in a kind of retrofit scenarios. And I think there's a real risk that we're at the moment we're looking at a kind of huge building physics disaster in Britain where people are kind of retrofitting existing buildings without properly thinking about the building physics and breathability and uh, hydroscopic properties of, of, of the, what they're doing within uh, yeah. particularly you know certain climates particularly like coastal areas where it's much more uh, the, much more of an issue there's a great um, traditional brickworks just north of london called hg matthews where they a third generation traditional brick maker all of the water that they use is in the make in manufacturing process is rainwater collected uh, biomass fired traditional brick kilns and so you know there's really sustainable approaches out there if you look for them. Uh, Alex, just continuing that, I was really interested in your application on your Victorian terrace. I've never yeah. seen that done before. Could you tell us a bit yeah, so how long that project took until oh, it was ready so and how thick it, the hemp was? Uh, it was a, a, approximately 100 mil. Um, so it was onto a um, 50 square metre uh, Victorian end terrace gable. Um, the brickwork wasn't in bad condition, uh, but if you've ever taken cement render off brick, uh, you'll know that it's never perfect. You never want to leave it on show. Um, and hempcrete is um, the ideal insulation material f when, the, when you haven't got a straight surface to work onto because it's a wet cast material that sets and holds its own shape. 
So it will go into all of those nooks and crannies and voids and, and set and form a perfect seal so that there's no um, voids within the, the wall build-up, which is where you tend to get um, more risk of interstitial condensation. So how long would that take? Uh, that took the actual application, as, as I said, we were shuttering it. Um, so the actual application probably took about three days uh, for, for a couple of guys, two or three guys. And then um, there's then a drying period um, of about um, four weeks, four or five weeks, and then the lime renders applied, yeah. And How would you deal with the brown detail? Brown detail yeah, so, um, the, uh, so the, the, uh, normally we, we, we just need to put a, um, something structural in for the hempcrete to sit on. Yeah. Um, which that, which te in that instance was foam glass blocks, okay. um, which are load-bearing enough. Um, and they're impermeable, so yes, and they're impermeable, and uh, but you you can also use a, a sort of insulation starter uh, track, but then you obviously have to you know keep that two hundred mil off the ground and then put something in to insulate afterwards below the level of that track. Thanks. I just wanted to come back to the brick thing. The one project that we hasn't slipped into this whole event are hollow clay bricks uh, which are used you know all over Europe and um, it, it is a very interesting discussion because I, I have had a lot of contact with Wienerberger who are one of the biggest producers uh, and they were told that the hollow clay blocks no, no longer met the German building regulations in terms of thermal efficiency so they've been trying to fill the holes in the blocks with stuff either you know, rock wool or uh, cellulose or, or whatever, you know, that, or po even polystyrene, they've even tried to get it, s sort of squirt it in. Uh, and uh, I find it completely bonkers because as far as I know, uh, air is the best insulator. So I don't quite understand why the holes in the blocks themselves wouldn't actually be satisfactory. But now what they're doing, I mean, Wienerberger have done a demonstration house in the UK, which I haven't actually seen, but... Um, and they talk about it being very eco and natural, but I think they've put polystyrene or something on the outside of it. Um, and they're very nice people, so I hate to criticize them. And I do think the hollow clay blocks are actually a great product in, in some circumstances. But it, it is interesting how you get into this kind of model about what, what to do. I, I, told, I told them they should use hempcrete with it, and they said, no, 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 hempcrete's no good. It doesn't provide any insulation, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I asked them who told them that, and they did actually tell me. So, you know, it's, it, is, it is difficult. Probably, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I'd just like to really emphasise um, the retrofit side of things, actually, because yeah. um, I, I think that, you know, retrofit's like the biggest challenge for all of, for, you know, for all of us. And I, I actually think these are the only materials that work for retrofit. You, can't, you just cannot... Um, put, you know, foamed insulation onto 19th century brick buildings. You just cannot. You, co you create so many problems. So, um, so it should be like we're the retrofit pioneer, you know. I mean, we did um, one of those retrofit, for, well, a couple of those retrofit for the future projects where we were using um, sheep's wool and wood fibre board on internal insulation because they were in conservation areas and you couldn't externally, you know. And, you know, it, it works. It, and it works in a way that the other products just don't. So no, I think that's our, yeah, and the, uh, you know, we're just waiting for that to take off. The, the STBA did, did quite a bit of work, didn't they, around the Green yeah. Deal and, and, and managed to yeah. get an acknowledgement that, that pre-1919 buildings should be, there should be an assumption for vapour permeable solutions in retrofitting. It's not um, just pre-1919 buildings. It's not, it's absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just yeah. not. How can we yeah. 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 yeah, there are plenty of those. You're all free to have done from this. Mm. Mm. Clearly, this is a glass house. It's still facing boldly. It's a problem that's mm. building us up. What needs, what awareness needs to be developed? Who needs to drive it? How is that, that change going to happen? It's not just wait for me. Well, I think... Oh. I was going to say, I think the a, um, ACB have done a fantastic job with their uh, carbon light retrofit, yeah. uh, which I think is a fantastic model for how the government should approach looking at retrofit, which kind of uh, takes a much more uh, kind of sensible, kind of also like <coughs> a triage approach, looking at the existing building and kind of diagnosing what the solution would be, but looking at it in terms of 
uh, not just insulation, but in terms of um, hydroscopic motion movement as well. So I think that kind of model is really fantastic and already, already exists out there. I mean, one of the points, just picking up on the kind of hempcrete and the, the kind of thermal performance, I think that leads one to a kind of broader question about how well represented some of these materials are within the kind of modelling tools and kind of recognised performance that you see. So mm. the reality is that not, not, lot of, not, not a lot of testing has been done on these products because, again, they're not kind of something manufactured by a major manufacturer. Um, so what you find, the testing, I know UCL have been doing kind of, you know, in-situ mm. monitoring on new values and often the They're performance are much better than you'd yeah. anticipate mm. from some of these kind of uh, natural or existing wall constructions and if I you just go to the kind of... Uh, yeah, we, we tried three times to get funding from the Technology Strategy Board to do post occupancy evaluation on our creek labs and they wouldn't give us any money. And eventually I got the guy from the GSB in the corner at a conference <laughs> I think where, where organisations are coming together, so that's the AECB, which is the Association for Environment Conscious Building, which I'm the vice chair, and um, which has a, a, an online course that you can, anybody can do, anyone in the industry. Um, the ASPBP. B ASPB. Sustainable Building Products. The yeah, STBA, um, <laughs> Sustainable Traditional Building. So, and there are there is a bit of an initiative at the moment to look at how these organisations can come together, but um, that's what needs to happen. But you know, the it's the mass weight it, of yeah. the plastics industry and, that, and and the will, isn't it? I think. Uh, I think there's plenty of will. I but think, you know, I mean, I, mean I, meant, I meant at a sort of um, regulatory level. Oh, no. Well, I've just been out in Belgium speaking at a, uh, an eco-cluster conference, uh, in, which is a part of an interreg project in, Bel in Walloon mm. in Belgium, where they're, um, they're having, having a series of events designed to increase um, natural building in Walloon uh, you mm. know, over the course of 18 months. So it's, it's just, I, th I think when we're talking about, for example, hempcrete actually is a good example of a material where there has been a lot of testing done and a lot of modelling and incorporating it into woofy models. And um, but it's about sort of sharing that information and, um, you know, as, as you quite rightly say, those, those organisations that you mentioned are, 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 you know, the public face of trying to get that information out there. But um, again... Yeah, thank you. First of all, um, thank you for the inspiring presentations for all of you. It was great to listen to you. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is about hempcrete. Second one is for the experience of archetype. So regarding hempcrete, um, so where we are moving to um, increase the efficiency of construction and decrease, decrease the wastefulness of construction, it's obvious that prefabrication is becoming more and more in focus and also reusability and recyclability. So if you could make some comments uh, on hempcrete in light of reusability and recyclability at the end of, let's say, its lifetime. And the second one is to archetype. Um, you were mentioning the passive house standard that you, you take it as a guiding principle in, in some of your projects, maybe all of them. Um, which is coming from Germany, um, from the inland, and was invented uh, to a climate which is, uh, like, let's say, sub substantially colder in the winter than the UK, and therefore has a pretty strict um, criteria for the building envelope itself uh, in terms of air tightness and insulation. What is your experience uh, applying this sort of air tightness and insulation? values uh, here in the UK. Do you think it's necessary? Do you think it, it's, it's uh, too much? Do you think uh, it should be more? Thank you. Do you want to answer the hempcrete one first? Uh, yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Yeah, okay. So, um, hempcrete, in theory, uh, obviously there's a huge range of ways you can detail it within the building, but certainly in the, in the basic hempcrete structure, which is generally a structural timber frame with um, hemp mixed with a lime binder, um, there should be nothing there that isn't recyclable uh, or compostable. Um, so, you've got basically uh, timber with steel fixings, uh, you've got the hemp uh, plant material and uh, the building lime which is binding that all together and lime uh, plasters. So, yeah, we don't have, actually, t Tom, do you know if the house at the BRE was disassembled? I don't it's know. Still there. Still it's there. still there. It's still there. there. Because they were, no, it's looking good. They, were talking, they were talking about taking it down um, and it, I'm glad they haven't yet because I think it would be quite good to do a project on the recyclability of. Well, well that's interesting you say that. I'll, we'll have to make a connection about yeah. this because it might be a risk, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, also, just to say, just in the first stages of getting involved with an interreg uh, project, which is looking specifically at um, the um, uh, circular economy, um, uh, you know, <coughs> hopefully here as well as across Europe, um, where where you're basically looking at potentially a completely different model for housing, where you would be uh, building housing and then uh, a different ownership model, where you then take it those components back in and recycle them and turn them into other buildings. So I'm um, quite excited about looking at that with hemp, this focus on the hempcrete. Uh, question on passive hours. So yeah, so about I think 61% of our work by value is passive hours and then the rest of it we try and apply the principles as far as we can. Uh, I think I, what I'd say is I don't think it's simply about a, a kind of U value. So what I mean in terms of the kind of tool like using PHPP and applying it, obviously you put in a climate file like you would in another, any other kind of environmental modelling tool and then the results are going to be different because you've got a UK climate rather than sort of, you know, uh, Germany. And, and we've been, recently we've been speaking uh, in Spain, so there's a lot of interest in Spain in, in Passive House and quite a lot of projects going off the ground down there. So it can be applied in different, in different climates. So I think, I think what I'd say is the bigger, bigger challenge really pitch with Passive House is actually, uh, you know, it started out as a domestic standard fundamentally, you know, looking often at kind of single dwellings. So a lot of the kind of presumptions in the early versions of the modelling were based around a domestic kind of standard and heat gains, etc. So when you scale it up to a larger commercial uh, projects with kind of, you know, for example, a school where you've got thousands of people and lots of heat, uh, then you have to kind of uh, sort of start to kind of adjust the standard accordingly. But I think that has been a kind of ongoing process um, which we, which has been a work very successfully. And I think, we, yeah, again, it, I don't think it really comes down, I think there's a, it's much really about the quality of construction. So touched on the idea that when you put your PIR board, boards together, you get a gap. You know, a, lo a lot of it, it's not just about the U value, so it's about, I think particularly maybe in the UK, it's actually been a really great tool, I think, to push forward a kind of quality agenda in terms of uh, construction of buildings. And a lot of the reasons why buildings are failing to perform as we, as we expect in the modelling, I mean, the modelling is flawed to some degree, but also on site, things simply aren't being built correctly, and, you know, attention to detail in terms of things like thermal bridging is just not there. So I think those are more important than the U values, necessarily. And in fact, Passive House was developed as a, as a um, not, not just around energy, although it's an energy standard, it was specifically around comfort. And so the, 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 the fundamental principle is that you're in, you're, you understand the construction and the building physics of the project enough to be able to control where um, air is coming in and out and where heat's coming in and out and where moisture's coming in and out. Those are the three things that you really need to understand and what PHPP helps you to do is to do that accurately so that you know, Passive House has been better able to predict um, performance than other standards used in this country by far. Um, so yeah, it's a very we find it a very, very useful tool for as a design base. So can I just pick up on, on your prefabrication off-site construction issue because um, I, I did an environmental audit a few years ago for a, a well-known off-site construction company who shall remain nameless because the report remained confidential with them and um, one of the things we found was that they had as much waste uh, during their process as actually we would get on a normal uh, modern building site. Uh, and um, 
in, in the particular area of country that they operated in, um, there were a lot of pig farmers, and the pig farmers got a lot of, uh, of uh, pig f arcs, I think they call them, made out of the waste bits from, from this company. Uh, uh, and and I, I, it was, I was quite shocked, actually, about, about it, is that, that the, the off-site thing can be a bit of a myth in terms of how, how, how materials are handled, but it depends which process it is and, and how it's done. Uh, I, I think some are probably much more efficient than others, you know, but it, it, you shouldn't just assume that it's more efficient. I mean, I mean when you're building with hempcrete on site, I mean, we, we reckon we, we have almost no waste uh, at all. Even the little bits of timber, you yeah. can find uses for them. It, one, of, one of the issues is about the... Uh, so taking hempcrete as a specific example, you've, you've got a, um, a, a, a detail, i.e. structural timber frame, buried in the centre of a hempcrete wall, which you're casting the whole building as one piece of material that um, has a very high level of thermal um, performance, but also... Um, is incredibly low tech and ver a very simple detail to build on site. And, um, you know, I'll stand by what I said, which is that when you start moving up to scale, you need to be using precast methods. But as soon as you you make something, whether it, whether it be a precast hempcrete block or a, st or, a, or a composite panel using hempcrete, maybe with other insulations and timber, as soon as you have something that you need to assemble on site, that is inherently vulnerable to air tightness and thermal bridging issues. So that you, the design becomes more complex. You start pulling in other materials like membranes and uh, other <laughs> coating materials that need to be introduced into the system, uh, which inevitably has a higher embodied carbon associated with it. So it's just, it's, it's a, it's, I would say whether it's on-site or off-site, it's more about intelligent design, really, and thoughtful design and design mm -hmm. having waste in the, the forefront of your mind when you're designing the system. Yeah. Sort of, um, lateral membrane with lateral that uh, <laughs> well, um, it's not that it's it, it's not that um, it's not that it can't work. It's that when people talk about it, saving time, energy, money, whatever, they don't address the fundamental issues, which are that. When it arrives on site, it, it must be assembled yeah. carefully and correctly yeah. and accurately, and we are not training people who are and able it, to do that. It's like so it, it's it's about the intelligence of yeah. the the building yeah. and the, all those issues, of, yeah. as you say, air tightness and, and, and um, thermal yeah. um, bridging become more problematic. And any system so that's complex yeah. you know, becomes harder to. I'm so it's it's not that they're not solvable. It's not it's not appropriate in some places. It's that it, we're not we don't talk about the problems when we talk about it. We don't talk about the things that need to be tackled. I mean, our experience has been... Um, How many times have you looked at um, <laughs> porter cabins and thought, oh, yeah. maybe the solution to this problem yeah. is a porter cabin? Well, I, I, must have done it. I must have had that <laughs> conversation <laughs> over my <laughs> lifetime, you know, 20 yeah. times. I've yeah. never actually done it, because in the end, it never was the best solution. No. We've looked at shipping containers and then yeah. gone, no, maybe not, yeah. Yeah. when you Do actually you start exactly. to model those. I, um, I was just going to say, I mean, we've, yeah, in prefabrication, we've kind of gone through looking at all sorts of different ways of kind of prefabricating kind of timber frame solutions, and we've generally, in the end, gone back to, uh, you know, we do get prefabricated timber cassettes brought to site, but we never pre-insulate them because the, yeah. the issues that arise having pre-insulated cassettes have been enormous in mm. terms of not being protected properly on yeah. site, kind of mould growth, water ingress. It's just not, it hasn't yeah. proved to be that practical. I mean, that's not to say, though, when you look at, you know, we went over to Sweden recently and looked at a kind of um, volume prefab house builder and went around their factory, and they've just absolutely nailed it. You know, they can, they can put up a house in, in a week, you know, get to site, it's done yeah. beautifully, all the windows are in there, it's pre-clad, it's pre-insulated, and it all works. So Ikea I actually think... You can do it, but it may be in Britain for some reason we can't do it very well at the moment. <laughs> well, I, think, I think it's worth saying that 200 years ago, bil buildings were made from materials on site by people who were skilled craftsmen. And over the last 250 years, we've gone more to manufacturing of building materials and transportation of those to site. And, and throughout that process, we've ended up in the second half of the 20th century where, where skills have you know, the, the skills have been lost from the trade and the money has moved from paying people to build in a skillful way 
to buying products that are easy for idiots to build with. Okay, and now we're taking actually the whole building process off site and putting it in a factory to take even more money yeah. away. And actually, you know, why is it that if you're a plumber or an electrician, you'll be, or an architect, you'll be uh, required to go back and do CPD and continue improving, keeping your skills up to date. But general builders, as far as I know, there's no sort of, certainly no requirement for people to, so, you know, if, you, if you're sort of, you know, the kind of 55, 60 year old builder and people are talking about air tightness and insulation, and what, you know, yeah, some of them have taken the trouble to find out what it's all about. The rest of them are still chucking in PIR boards with a 40 mil gap in between them. And it's interesting so when the, the European, at the European level, um, you know, there was a recognition, wasn't there, with the kind of nearly zero energy building program, that that also had to include a whole kind of skills focus as well, and how that has materialised in the UK. I'm not sure whether it has really. I mean, I think you're picking up on a point on, on the, well, yeah. picking up on prefab. You know, your point about skills. The key thing about this Swedish company is that the people putting up really knew what they were doing, and that's what they did every day. Oh. They were directly employed by the company yeah. who oh. built them. They had a job, you know, proper job and employment rights, and they had to invest in what they were doing. Here, and I won't 